Homestuck is about 800,000 words, which is just shy of Harry Potter's 1 million. It's one of the most comprehensive tomes out there, but at the same time, there are some gaps in the lore. I'm here today to remedy one of those gaps. This topic was voted on by a Twitter poll, and apparently everyone who voted for this wants me to suffer. Researching this made me want to commit atrocities, and the script I wrote, while I envisioned a quick few pages, I now have four videos worth of material to cover. This is one of those videos. Trolls are one of, if not the most interesting concepts in Homestuck. So much so that there have been numerous games dedicated to expanding the lore and the world of Alternia. Homestuck has a way of shoving the lore off to the side in some regard, and trolls seem to be the sole exception, the aspect that, arguably, the fan community has latched onto the most. Now, a quick aside. This video discusses biology, and as such, I'll be discussing... Congress. You know, intercourse. Copulation. Bumpin' Uglies. The Two-Backed Beast. The Four-Legged Tango. As such, I have no idea how much YouTube will like this video. So to play things safe, I'm going to be as clinical as possible and not include any graphics that would be construed as pornographic. Instead, I'm going to include very symbolic depictions, so please bear with me and try to imagine troll particulars and ignore the fact that we're all horrible perverts. Now, I've written about trolls before, most notably in the Versecumentary, but I've also done some writing on AO3 on the topic. I've also had some other ideas since. This video series is going to be broken up into three parts, plus an extra fourth part that was released earlier. Canonicity, fanonicity, speculation, and a Twitter thread full of some fan theories. The final one is out on my YouTube right now, and the other two, um, if you're watching this in the future, are out as well. The first segment, which is the one you're watching right now, will be devoted to scouring Homestuck and its secondary works for every reference to troll, biology, and reproduction. So, let's fucking go. Back here again, can't get enough of JoJo explains some interesting stuff. Broadly speaking, each segment in this video series will be answering three questions with different information. The three questions are, firstly, what are trolls materially? The second is, how do trolls reproduce? And the third, perhaps technically more under the scope of xenoanthropology than xenobiology, but what are trolls like societally? On the surface, this may seem simple, but soon we'll find out it isn't. Firstly, let's catalog all the information canon can give us about the topic. I'm going to be treating the following works as canon. Homestuck, Homestuck 2, the epilogues, Pester Quest, the Friend Sim, and the Hive Swap series, as well as Paradox Space. Let's start with the first question, what are trolls materially? We can approach this by constructing a typical troll. First, let's take a look at Homestuck's art. Critically, since the characters in Homestuck are rendered symbolically, many elements are left out of many of their depictions, especially their sprites. What I mean is, sometimes Carcat doesn't look like he has arms, but he does. As such, I'm going to try to work with their least symbolic depictions. To start with, let's discuss what every healthy troll has in common. Gray skin, tricolored horns, bipedal, two arms with humanoid digits, teeth of varying sharpness, noses, presumably, eyes with yellow sclera, and humanoid ears. It appears that some of these parts have different names and function differently than humans, which I've discussed in the enumeration on screen. This makes sense, as they were responsible for creating humanity. In a meta sense, they are heavily anthropomorphized, much like most alien species in media, such as the Greys or Mass Effect, but in an in-universe sense, it's likely the other way around, as humans are trollpomorphized because trolls created them first. Either way, in sum, they're similar outwardly in these many ways. There are certain things we can extrapolate as well, based on what we know about them, and the various terms that the trolls have been seen using. They have no navels. They have hearts or some analog. They have brains or some analog. They have shame globes. They have breasts or some analog. They have spines or some analog. They have esophaguses. They have seed flaps, spinal crevices, skeletal structure of some kind, chitinous skin, lungs, other internal organs, bulges of unknown use, acid tracts, hair, which is always black, occasionally with natural streaks, colored skin protrusions on the abdomen, nipples, possibly, and lips, which are sometimes cat-shaped. 
It's unknown in canon what troll insides are made of, since we see very little of them in canon, but the function of many of these organs are safe to assume. They're also shown to have blood, which is a topic in and of itself that I'll get to in a moment. These 27 appendages all appear to be present on trolls of a respective gender, and while not an exhaustive list, it does answer many questions about their physical traits. Notably, trolls are also non-mammalian, as they lack breasts used for feeding, as Arqueus explicitly states that trolls cannot lactate, much to his dismay. Great. Using this list, the general troll forms. They're humanoid with many human analog internal organs, the main difference being the horns, teeth, eyes, and blood. There might be other differences internally, but in canon it's impossible to tell. They breathe oxygen, as they are able to cohabitate on the meteor and on Earth C in the sequels. Also, all trolls are shown to have burned in the sun, but this is likely not due to some solar allergy, but instead due to the intense nature of Alternia and Bephorus's suns. Trolls are shown in the sunlight safely on Earth C. It's unknown if trolls have some kind of night vision, but this is also unlikely since the MSPA reader can see normally on Alternia in the Friend Sim and Pester Quest. One place humans and trolls differ is diet. Once again, since they cohabitated on the meteor, it's safe to assume that their diet is similar, but notably trolls on several occasions are shown to eat insects and bugs, many characters mentioning such things as grub sauce, and Charon eating worms. It's unknown whether this is for taste or simply because the animals are more available on the troll's planets. Now, the typical troll has three main exceptions that differ greatly from the gray humanoids we've discussed. The three main differences warrant discussion on their own. 1. Hemotype. 2. Amphibiousness. And 3. Rainbow Drinkers. Hemotype is the first thing that not all typical trolls have in common. There are 12 groups of trolls, each one with slightly different traits. Broadly, the term hemospectrum is something of a misnomer. Spectrum implies that there is a spectrum of troll colors, but in reality there are only 12 discrete types that share features between them. In other words, you are either inside or outside a type, with no overlap or variance inside these types. All like-blooded trolls have congruent blood and associated abilities. The 12 troll types are ordered from most to least common. Rust, Bronze, Gold, Olive, Jade, Teal, Blue, Indigo, Purple, Violet, Mutant Red, Fuchsia, and Lime extinct. The 13 types are organized into four loose categories in troll society. 1. Low Bloods rust, bronze, and gold. Midbloods, olive, jade, lime, and teal. Highbloods, blue, indigo, and purple. And royal bloods, violet, and fuchsia. Mutant red bloods exist outside of the hemospectrum. There are also derogatory terms for certain blood types, such as shit blood and gutter blood, that certain higher blood characters use. There is a considerable social stigma on the lower bloods, since they are notably less powerful individually. Lifespan also correlates to blood type as well as population size. It's unknown how this occurs. For example, rust bloods have only, quote, a few dozen sweeps, blue bloods live many sweeps, and fuchsias are shown to live hundreds of thousands of years. We've already discussed the typical troll, so now let's discuss the typical troll of each one of these casts. 1. Rust. Rust bloods are the most common. Their blood is close in color to real-life humans. Vriska mentions that many rust bloods could have telekinesis. These abilities are different from troll to troll, with Aradia and her ancestor Damara able to move huge objects, whereas Zephyros can only move very small ones with difficulty. Whether this is due to training or inborn ability is un- Their lifespans, as mentioned before, are only a few dozen sweeps, or from 30 to 50 years. All rust bloods have blunt teeth, and their horns are larger than other casts. 2. Bronze. Bronze bloods are another low blood type. Friska claims that many brown bloods can commune with animals, and this is true of Tavros, but no other brown blood is shown to be able to do this, not even Tavros's ancestor Rufio. Skillacoriga is shown to have an affinity for animals, but this is not psychic ability. Their lifespans are less than humans. Bronze bloods have sharp teeth often protruding past their mouths, and their horns jut out more than other casts. 3. Gold Gold bloods are the highest of the low bloods, and known for their more uniform psychic abilities. All gold bloods possess what is referred to as psionics, and many of them have a two-tone scheme. 
The psionics are sometimes referred to as vision twofold, but it's unknown how widely this term is used. It's possible that Solix's vision twofold is unique to mutant gold bloods, according to Vriska, but all of them have some psychic power. Gold bloods have an affinity for bees. Gold bloods have a unique condition known as void rot that can afflict them, a deficit where the body cannot retain the power. Gold bloods are used as batteries to power faster than light travel on Alternian starships. Gold bloods live approximately as long as a human. Gold bloods have sharp teeth, usually in rows, and their horns come in groups of two. Low blood commonalities. All low bloods are comparatively common and short lived compared to higher castes, and all of them have some variety of general psychic ability. Since they are so common, they constitute the proletariat or plebeians of troll society, being the most populous and least socially endowed, consuming media and low class goods. 4. Olive. Olive bloods, while not possessing any psychic abilities, are more physically endowed. Trolls like Polypa, Conil, and Nepeta all display great physical strength, and in particular, agility. More mild-mannered olives like Charon and Boldir are still physically fit. They are the most similar in physiology to normal humans. Many olive bloods live in the wilderness away from society. Olive bloods live about as long as humans. Olive blood horns are widely varied with no commonalities. 5. Jade. Jade Bloods are one of two classes that has one specific job. They are all tasked with caring for the Mother Grub and are confined to the Brood Caverns. More on this later. While possessing no psychic or special traits, all Jade Bloods have one specific task. It's unknown whether this task is imposed socially or instinctive. In other words, it's unknown whether Jades do this job due to their inborn biology or if they are raised to do so. Either way, during the Dolorosa's time, jades were forbidden from going to the surface, though this rule has obviously changed during the time of Homestuck and the Frensin. Jade bloods are also female only, with one known exception, Lank Bombix. It's unknown if this is socially or biologically. More on troll gender later. Suffice to say, they are unremarkable other than their task in the Brood Caverns. Jade's lifespans are unknown. All jade bloods have a hook shape on their horn, and many of them have sharp canine fangs, much like vampires. 6. Teal. Teal bloods are another mid blood cast with no inherent abilities. Like jades, they have a certain role, but unlike jades, the role is more varied. They are civil servants, more broadly, bureaucrats, lawyers, shopkeepers, secretaries, etc. Much like jades, it's unknown if this is social or biological. Teal bloods have similar lifespans to humans. Teal horns are all symmetrical, jutting out from the temples. Midblood commonalities. Midbloods are the humanoid trolls, all of which have no remarkable powers. They're all defined by their jobs, with the exception of olives, who are heavily implied to fill outdoorsy roles. They all have human-like lifespans, and in society they occupy white-collar jobs. They are the working class. 7. Blue or Cerulean. Cerulean is more an apt name, as blue blood is an umbrella term for teal, blue, and indigo bloods alike, but this is more true blue blood. Notably, blue bloods in real life means noble birth, and aptly, the bloods above blue are significantly more privileged. Ceruleans live in much larger hives than their low-blooded counterparts, living longer as well. They also have abilities related to the mind, though specifically these abilities manifest differently. For instance, the Circuit Lion possesses mind control and mind reading, similar to Jedi mind tricks, whereas the troll Ardata Karmia is able to freeze subjects in place. On top of this, Vriska and her ancestor also have limited X-ray vision, but this is unknown as to whether it is cast-based. Many Ceruleans have odd-shaped pupils or eyes, some even having more than two actual eyeballs. 8. Indigo Indigo bloods are strong. Even small members of the cast, like Amicia, possess great physical strength, and those who train, like Equius and Nikki, are powerful beyond belief. That's really their all is to say on the matter. Indigo horns have jutting portions on the ends, like hooks or arrows, and all of them are symmetrical. 9. Purple. Like indigos, purples are strong. Instead of raw power, though, purples are more specifically physically imposing. This imposition increases with age, exemplified in Chahut and the Grand High Blood, with younger members like Kakaro and Gamzee being smaller. All of them have an affinity for clowns and showmanship of various types. Like Jades and Teals with their roles, it's unknown whether this is societal or biological. 
Either way, this feeds into their religious beliefs which parallel Juggalos in real life. All of them wear face paint and their caste is ostensibly the ruling class of the land dwellers, as they are the highest caste of them. Many purple bloods possess chuckle voodoos related to their religion, which little is known about, but it's a potent psychic ability. It appears that every purple blood can learn this, but not all of them choose to. Their horns are all wavy in shape, but otherwise diverse. They have particularly sharp teeth. High blood commonality. High bloods are all incredibly hardy. They live long lives, they're hard to kill, and they're all shown to be endowed with large mansions and palaces. While not on top, they are certainly privileged and able to uniformly live in luxury. They're rarer and concerned with administrative duties if they have jobs at all. 10. Violets. Violets are the bulk of what's referred to as the royals or sea trolls. The main difference between these trolls and land dwellers is that they are amphibious, able to live on land or under sea. They have fins on the sides of their heads and presumably gills. They do not have any psychic abilities, but they are more hardy even than purple bloods. Very few violets have been shown, so it's unknown what commonalities they have amongst one another. 11. Fuchsia. There are only ever two fuchsia bloods at any one moment, the mature empress and the immature heiress. They live for thousands of years on Bephorius and Alternia alike. They are tasked with running the planet. They appear to have a biological urge to kill others of their caste to establish supremacy, as noted with Mina interacting with Feferi. On Alternia, both fuchsias share a bond with the eldritch god Glubgalib, both taking care of the being along with their normal empress duties. Empresses and heiresses also have control over the drones, an army of biological automatons which facilitate both peacekeeping and reproduction. It's likely this control, as well as control over Glubgalib's powers, that allows their dominance. Royal Commonalities Royal bloods all have longevity and are easy to kill, and while they are reclusive, they run the show. The Troll Bourgeoisie they also both comfortably dwell in land and underwater, and presumably have different lungs to account for this, but the details other than neck fins are unknown. 12. Mutant Reds Some trolls possess candy red mutant blood. This blood cast seems to be most functionally similar to rust bloods without the psychic abilities. The only three known examples all do not possess specific powers and are somewhat physically weak compared to their peers. Their horns are all nubby, but it's unknown if this is a feature of their blood type or not. On Alternia, these mutants are culled. 13. Lime Lime bloods on Alternia are uniformly extinct. They used to be between gold and olive on the hemo spectrum, but due to undisclosed powerful abilities that proved subversive to the Empress's reign, she had them eradicated. Oh, okay, that was a lot. We talked about blood casts and amphibious royals, leaving just one thing to discuss about blood. Rainbow Drinkers Rainbow Drinkers are essentially troll vampires. They have some traits that no other troll type shares. Luckily, they are an outlier, so their inclusion only warrants a simple explanation. Only Jade Bloods are able to become Rainbow Drinkers, the only two we meet in canon being Porim and Kanaya. Interestingly, Kanaya's ancestor and Porim's counterpart, the Dolorosa, does not become a Rainbow Drinker. It appears that Rainbow Drinkers' natures remain dormant until they die, where they then awaken in their new state. Drinkers, once they awaken, are characterized by their glowing skin, which is an ability that with practice they can control. They retain any injuries that were responsible for killing them, but over time appear able to heal even huge wounds, like Kanaya's sucking stomach cavity. Drinkers drink blood, but it's unknown if they can survive without it. Either way, it is a great source of desire for them. The drinking doesn't appear to kill the drink E, as Kanaya drank from Terezi at some point without the blood loss being fatal. They are also more powerful and strong than their jade peers. Rose and Kanaya speculate as to why rainbow drinkers exist, but all of this is inconclusive. In sum, they're bioluminescent, immortal, and they drink blood. They can also go out in the Alternian sun, unlike the rest of their friends. Alright, now we're done for real. We've done all this, but we've only answered one of the questions. We now know what trolls are materially, so the next question, of course, is... How do they reproduce? Oh, yeah! But seriously, let's start by discussing how canon describes the troll's life cycle. From Homestuck. 
Trolls have a complicated reproductive cycle. It's probably best not to examine it in much detail. The need to seek out concupiscent partners comes with more urgency than typical reproductive instincts. When the Imperial Drone comes knocking, you'd better be able to supply genetic material to each of his filial pails. If you have nothing to offer, he will kill you without hesitation. The genetic material, without going into detail, is a combinative genetic mix from Matesprit and Kismis' pairs, respectively. The pails are all offered to the mother grub who can only receive such precombined material. She then combines it all into one incestuous slurry and begins her brooding. This doesn't mean the initial combination was for naught, however. In the slurry, more dominant genes rise to the fore, while the more recessive ones find less representation in the brood. Especially among strong Matesprit and Kismis' pairings yield more dominant genetic material. The more powerful the complement or potent the rivalry, the more dominant the genes. Troll reproduction sure is weird. We all take a moment to lament how pedestrian the human reproductive system is, and further lament that the phrase incestuous slurry is not a feature of common parlance in human civilization. This, as far as things go, is pretty straightforward. Here's another passage. Your Lucis looked after you since you were very young, in lieu of any biological parents whom you have never known. No young troll ever knows his or her blood parents, nor could such a lineage ever be accurately traced. Adult trolls supply their genetic material to the filial pails carried by imperial drones and offered to the monstrous mother grub deep underground in the brooding caverns. She then combines all the genetic material into one diabolical incestuous slurry and lays hundreds of thousands of eggs at once. The eggs hatch into young larval trolls which wriggle out into locate cozy stalactites from which to spin their cocoons. After they pupate, the young troll with his newfound limbs undergoes a series of dangerous trials. If they survive, they are chosen by a member of the diverse and terrifying subterranean monster population native to Alternia. This creature becomes the troll's Lucis, and together they surface and choose a location to build a hive. The building process is facilitated by carpenter droids left on the planet to cater to the young, but only for building. They're on their own otherwise. The vast majority of adult trolls are off-planet, serving some role in the forces of an ongoing imperial conquest, besieging other star systems in the name of Alternian glory. The culture and civilization on Homeworld is maintained almost entirely by the young. Trolls sure are weird. Okay, between these two passages we have a decent idea of reproduction. It's a bit more convoluted than human reproduction and includes at least four participants, two sexual partners, a drone, the mother grub. Beyond this, everything is speculation. I should mention, however, in a Paradox Space comic, troll reproduction is given in dubious detail, but this is later revealed to have been a mockingly described section by Dave and doesn't go in-depth into the process. That was a lot easier than the Bloodcast section. For now, let's move on. In my more speculative sections of these videos, I'll have more to say about troll reproduction, so don't you worry. Let's talk about the final question. What are trolls like societally? For much like us, trolls do live in a society. Much of troll society has actually been covered in the Hemocast section, i.e. lifespans and social roles, but there are some elements that went undiscussed, made more difficult by the fact that troll society is bifurcated between two instances of their planets. As such, I'll be discussing troll society in parts. 1. Wigglers 2. Adolescents 3. Adults 4. Hierarchies 5. Culling 6. Romance 7. Gender and 8. Before us. 1 through 3 constitute the life cycle, 4 and 5 are the structure of Alternian society, 6 and 7 are the interpersonal issues, and 8 is the differences between uh, Alternia and Before us. Wigglers. Wigglers are newly hatched trolls. They are small grubs that eventually pupate and metamorphosize into adolescent trolls inside of the brood caverns, emerging after the trials, where it is implied that many wigglers perish. After their pupation, they are chosen by a Lucis who acts as their parent in a symbiotic social bond. Adolescence. Once they're chosen by a Lucis, the troll chooses a place to live. On Alternia, this process is streamlined by the carpenter droids and at a very young age create their homes, learning to live in them while taking care of their Lucis. Adolescent here is a misnomer. 
At this age, they are sexually mature, so biologically speaking, they are adults. However, they do continue to grow, just not through metamorphosis anymore. Adults. Adult trolls are uniformly much larger and imposing, evidenced primarily in the friend sim. Even though different castes have different lifespans, adult is defined by a similar age range, implying that all trolls mature at the same rate, they just exist for different amounts of time as an adult. I.e., two 20-year-old trolls of rust and indigo blood would both be equally mature, but the same rust blood might not live as long as the adult. Adults are also shipped off-world on Alternia to serve the Empress. More on this later. Hierarchies The main axis of power on Alternia is the Hemo system. As I've said, it's unknown whether Hemo casts are imposed biologically or socially, but either way, they play a major role in every troll's life. It's said early on that a troll's job is dictated by their caste. That said, the only two castes that seem to quote-unquote matter materially are purple and fuchsia. Other castes have minor differences in means, but purple and fuchsia bloods ostensibly are the two different ruling classes. There are shops in troll society, but it appears largely socialized, with many institutions such as libraries operating, all of which are manned by teenagers. Since we never see off-world adult trolls, we never get a chance to see what adult society is like. On planets, Alternian kids cooperate and perform the various jobs with a large amount of jobs in the entertainment industry. Very few trolls are depicted doing production jobs, many of the lowbloods relegated to servant-like positions like janitorial work and manual labor rather than things like food production. This could be because we only see a single troll suburb of Outglut and not a food-producing troll community in Friend Sim. Culling Troll culture is significantly more ruthless than human culture, almost eugenic in nature. It's likely due to the different way that they're brought up, namely in escaping a cavern, but even adolescents are unceremoniously killed for small legal infractions, or just being deformed in some way. The severity of this seems to go up the lower on the spectrum you are. Still, trolls have a much less existential position about death. In a meta sense, it's likely due to the grimsical nature of the works, but in universe, it's likely due to the trolls' more collectivist leanings. A single death means less to their society than humans, so they likely evolved to be less worried about their own singular lives. Still, this is just speculation. Romance. Okay, you've all been waiting for this shit. It's the meme. Honestly, this ground is so well-tread by now, I kind of dreaded explaining this can of worms. So, I'm just gonna read the Homestuck definition, because it's pretty, pretty well described there. The problem is that when the tr subject of troll romance is broached, our sparing human intellects instantly assume the most ingratiating posture of surrender imaginable. But we do our best to understand regardless. Humans only have one form of romance, and though we consider it a complicated subject, spanning a wide range of emotions, social conventions, and implications for reproduction, it's ultimately a superficial slice of what trolls consider the full body of romantic experience. Our concept of romance, in spite of its capacity to fill our art and literature, and to rule our individual destinies like little else, is still just that. A single, linear construct. A concept usually denoted by a single symbol. The heart. Troll romance is more complicated than that. Troll romance needs four symbols. Their understanding of romance is divided into halves and then halved again, producing four quadrants. The flushed, colliginous, pale, and ashen quadrants. Each quadrant is grouped by the half they share, whether horizontally or vertically, depending on the overlapping properties one examines. The sharpest dichotomy from an emotional perspective is drawn between red romance and black romance. Red romance, comprised of the flushed and pale quadrants, is a form of romance rooted in strongly positive emotions. Black romance, with its colliginous and ashen quadrants, is rooted in the strongly negative. On the other hand, the vertical bifurcation has to do with the purpose of the relationship, regardless of the emotions behind it. Those quadrants which are concupiscent, the flushed and colliginous, have to do with facilitating the elaborate reproductive cycle of trolls. Those of which are conciliatory, the pale and ashen, would be more closely likened to platonic relationships by human standards. There are many parallels between human relationships and the various facets of troll romance. 
Humans have words to describe relationships of a negative nature or of a platonic nature. The difference is, for humans, those relationships would never be conceptually grouped with romance. Establishing these sort of relationships for humans is not driven by the same primal forces that drive our tendency to couple romantically. But for trolls, those primal forces involve themselves in the full palette of these relationships, red or black, torrid or friendly. Trolls typically feel strongly compelled to find balance in each quadrant and seek gratifying relationship that each describes. The challenge is particularly tortuous for young trolls who must reconcile the wide range of contradictory emotions associated with this matrix while understanding the nature of their various romantic urges for the first time. Great, I want to hurt people now. Long story short, trolls conceptualize romance in four quadrants, love, soulmates, rivals, and the polycule. This is just an oversimplification, of course, but honestly, I don't have much to add until the speculation section, so let's just move on gender. Okay, now we're talking. I could talk about troll gender all fucking day long. Again, I have more to say about this in the speculative sections, but let's go over gender as it exists in comic. So long story short, trolls have two main genders, just like humans, male and female. Unlike humans, however, gender has zero bearing over reproduction. Trolls are mostly bisexual, with some exceptions, but moreover, trolls can constructively breed with any combination of genders. This implies a lot, but again, I'm saving that for the speculation. The main thing, however, is that gender, instead of being linked to sex, is linked to appearance in troll culture. Cankery also implies that gender roles are pseudoscience. This appears to be primarily true, but there are trends that trolls identify with. Male trolls are more soft-spoken and more career-oriented, where female trolls are more hostile. This isn't a rule, more like a generalization, but trolls seem to relate to this. Karkat at one point warns Tavros against playing games for girls, implying that said games are often more vicious and dangerous. Still, these roles, unlike human society, seem not linked to reproduction, but instead on general appearance. Beforeus. Beforeus is a similar planet, but unlike Alternia, the meaning of cull is reversed. That's to say that instead of being killed, the collectivist nature of trolls is leaned into more heavily, and the cold troll is instead given to the care of someone higher on the hemospectrum. This likely means that there are different social norms, and furthermore, adults are presumably still present on Before Us, but this isn't explored extensively. All in all, it seems to be a place of less strife and explicit murder, and more strife with subtle means of oppression. And that's it. That's all the groundwork for troll biology and anthropology in Homestuck proper. If you're still raring to go like I am, don't worry. This is just one part. Next, let's depart from the text and try to fill in some more gaps with Fanon. Thanks for watching, everyone. This video is fun to make, and researching this while tortuous was fun. If you're new here, please subscribe and check out the other videos in the troll biology series. Also, check out the Vrisk Omnibus if you're curious about Vrisk Circuit. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Tab, a totally awesome beverage. Tab, for when you need a kick of sugar without the sugar. I'd also like to thank my patrons, Jojo and Luna. If you're interested in supporting me, Patreon is the best way to do so. See you later.